Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, have I had a time getting here this evening. I left the house, got in my car, was going to head to my office to pick up my notes for the study for, for this taping and zip on to the studio and tape the show. But when I pulled out of my driveway, I got an alert on my car that the front right, front left tire only had 19 pounds of pressure in it. So I called my nephew. He is such a good young man. He, uh, he comes to my rescue all the time. And he was near where I was out working. So I pulled up behind him. He, he had a compressor in his vehicle. And he started to work on my tire and realized that I had a screw in my tire. So we had to pull the screw, plug it. He put a plug in because he knows how to do that. I, I wouldn't even have a clue how to do it. He plugged it, he put air in it and said, you're good to go for at least like to get you to the studio and back home, but you need to go get a tire tomorrow or have it fixed tomorrow. So I'm just, I guess what I'm trying to say is along with every detour, with every distraction, with every disappointing move, God counters that all the time. I could have been stranded, I could have been with a completely flat tire, missing my studio time, but God saw fit to put my nephew close to where I was. I mean, he was maybe two streets away from where I was when I called him. Literally, let me think, three streets away from where I was. And he had everything he needed to take care of me. That's a picture of my God. He has everything I need to take care of me. He has everything that I could possibly need to take care of me. That's, I love when God does that before I come into the studio and tape. That he, he always gives me something to, to just grin about or to share with you or to hold on to. And so tonight, can I just share with you that God has everything you need when you need it. Now, it may not seem like it's on your time all the time because his timing is perfect. But he took care of me in a way tonight that I'm just praising him for. I'm so grateful for a God who loves me, who gives me a caring nephew. My nephew, his name is Eli, just loves me. And I love him. And he has always run to my rescue whenever I've needed him. And I praise God that God puts, that he puts people in our lives that can be his hands and his feet when we need him the most. So I'm just praising God and giving him glory for getting me to the studio tonight through the wondrous love of him and my nephew, Eli. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father. So tonight or today, I'm actually taping in the evening, which I don't normally do, but today I have a message called The Straight and Narrow. And I l hold on to the end because God showed me something I had not ever seen about this scripture. Um, as we read through Luke's gospel, or as I read through Luke's gospel, um, we see Jesus teaching the crowds. That's really what Luke's gospel is all about, is Jesus teaching the crowds. And as they listen, I know if it were me, and I'm, I'm sure it was them, questions would arise in their minds. And sometimes they're the same questions that you and I would wrestle with. So let me show you where I'm, what I'm talking about. Luke 13, 22 and 23. Luke 13, 22 and 23. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. And someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? This is a very interesting question, especially so since we're talking about ancient Israel. 
Um, right now, we have many words in our vocabulary, in our Christian vocabulary, in our religious vocabulary, that have changed over the years. The word saved is one of them. That word has picked up a lot of spiritual baggage since this verse was written. When we hear the word saved, we, uh, it has a special meaning to us. Uh, we think about someone who has prayed the sinner's prayer, or we think about someone that has accepted Jesus as their Lord and their Savior, or someone who has become a Christian. But when this, this question was first posed to Jesus, that word had no such connotation. It wasn't a Christian or religious word in those days. It meant to be rescued from danger or destruction. You got saved from that flood. It also meant to be kept safe and sound. Oh, he was saved from that fire. Or as well as someone suffering and with a disease and they got saved out of that disease. When this person questioned Jesus, he was speaking about the natural world. You see, Israel was under the slavery of the Romans. The, it, it was an oppressive Roman Empire at the time. And there was a lot of fear in the Israelites over how it was all going to turn out for them. Now, there were, known, there were some groups called zealots among the Jews. Uh, these were anti-Roman terrorists, basically, who were making bold attacks against Roman authority, which made Rome God a man. The Roman emperors were known for um, making very rash and impetuous decisions to wipe out nations who rebelled against them. And so the Jews were concerned with the zealots coming against the Rome that the Roman emperor would say, let's just get rid of all the Jews. Let's just completely obliterate the Jews from the face of the earth. And so the question was posed to Jesus, well, how, how many people are going to be saved? Is there going to be a remnant saved? Even Jesus caused them, the Roman authorities, to want to kill him. And this is, this is interesting. Um, let me read John 11, 47 through 50. John 11, 47 through 50. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man, Jesus, his works of many signs, if we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. See, they were afraid. And one of them, Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation, that the whole nation should perish. You see, even the Jewish authorities were afraid that Rome was going to come and just wipe out the Jewish nation. And so when this man was asking, or whoever it was, was asking, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? It wasn't a spiritual question. It was a literal, gosh, uh, are, are we going to be okay? Is Rome going to come and obliterate us as a nation? Are there going to be a few left over? That was the heart of the question. Now, throughout the Bible, there were prophecies about times of persecution, of course, where only a remnant of Israel survived. I believe that this was the thinking behind this question. This man wanted to plan ahead for his very survival. Jesus seems to almost ignore the question and begins to tell the crowd a more about a more important remnant to be a part of. Not a physical, natural remnant, but a spiritual remnant. He starts to talk about the final judgment. So this is the rest of Luke 13, 23. Actually, it's like 23b to 25. 
So Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way, and they asked the question, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And here's Jesus' answer. He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow gate, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading. Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I do not know you or where you come from. Jesus tells the crowd in response to this man's question, Lord, is there going to be a remnant? Are are any of us going to be saved? And Jesus said, there's a more important time that you need to be concerned about being saved being part of. Jesus tells the crowd that there's a way to an abundant life through a narrow, tight gate or door. He puts it in a way that our English translations don't do justice to. The phrase, make every effort, because that's what he says. He said to them, make every effort. That means to contend. It's what an athlete does. It's what an athlete puts themselves through in order to make it to the Olympics or to the Olympic gold medal even better. It means that there's a struggle that must take place. You might think that in the Olympics, the struggle is against other athletes. It's not true. The struggle is not against other athletes. The struggle is to contend with your own body and the ability to cause or make your body to perform or contend for whatever race you might be in. It needs to be disciplined in order to win that event. That's what the word make every effort means. To contend like an athlete puts their body through such hard, hard, hard things to condition it to win the final prize. And that's the word that Jesus chose. He said to them, contend, put your body through, put yourself through such rigorous works. Not that you gain salvation through your works, but you have to contend for your faith to enter through that narrow gate. That's why Jesus said that many will try to enter. Now, this phrase means to seek or desire. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. This phrase means to seek or desire to enter in. But I want to show you something that uh, it, it just twisted my head. And I say that when uh, I just don't know what to do with myself when God reveals a truth to me. And it comes from the word narrow. He said to them, make every effort, contend, work as hard as you possibly can to enter through the narrow door. Now, that doesn't mean we have to work for our salvation at all. Because many, I tell you, will try and enter it, will not be able to. All we have to do is believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Receive what he did on the cross for us. That is all I have to do. But I have to do my part. I have to not sin. I have to live a holy life. Now, I'll never live a purely holy and righteous life on this earth because mm, we're born with a sin nature. Now, that nature is exchanged for his nature when I get born again, when I get saved, when I am conformed to his image. But I will not be perfected until I get there. I'm a work in progress, and so are you. So here's what I want to show you about that word, narrow. Narrow is the gate. Narrow 
is the door straight. Some translations call it the straight gate or the straight door. That word narrow comes from a root word. Here it comes. That means narrow from obstacles standing close about. What in the world? This lit my spirit up inside. I mean, literally lit up my spirit. Because it's not narrow because Jesus makes it narrow. It's narrow because of obstacles standing close about. In other words, there's a road, a highway of holiness, Isaiah, that leads us right to the cross. But there are obstacles in our way. Satan always throws obstacles in our paths, always wanting us to be tripped up or stumbling through. And so what the obstacles, and, and this is why the word is, I love the word, narrow because of obstacles standing close about. So when I hit an obstacle, I have a choice. I can either go outside that obstacle to a broad way, or I can go inside through the obstacle in the narrow way. It's like looking at two barrels that are in the way, and I have a decision to make. Am I going to go around the outside of the barrels and go on a detour of the obstacles and let the obstacles take me further and further and further off my path? Or am I going to choose the narrow way through those obstacles, the Jesus way, not the sin way, not the detour way, but the way, the truth, the way, and the truth. Am I going to let those obstacles narrow my path? Yes, I am. And then I hit other obstacles and I have a choice again to go around them on the outside or around them on the inside, narrowing my path even further. This is what Jesus is talking about. It's a very specially chosen word, narrow, straight, narrow from obstacles standing close about. You see, many people come through obstacles and they take the long way around. They take the outer road. They take the detour and go around, but it takes them further off the narrow path and puts them on the broad path. And then they come to even more obstacles. They might encounter a, a hard situation in their lives or a devastating piece of news, or an outright sin, adultery, stealing, lying, cheating, whatever it might be. And, and that's the obstacle, and they choose to go around, take the broader path. Instead of letting that obstacle narrow their path and bring them into the conforming path that Jesus puts us on. I love it. I love it. He said to them, make every effort, contend to enter through the narrow gate. That means I have to work at the narrow gate. I don't have to work for my salvation. I'm telling you again, this is not about works for salvation. All you have to do is invite Jesus into your heart, give him your confession of sins, accept what he did on the cross, and live in his mercy and grace. You're saved. You're saved. But we're going to encounter obstacles in our way. We are going to encounter the enemy's deceptions or Satan's schemes. We're bound to run in to obstacles. It's the nature of the enemy. It is Satan's nature to trip us up, to try to bring us or take us away from God. It's what he did to Adam and Eve. They were walking so closely on that narrow path with God, fellowshipping with him, walking with him in the garden in the cool of the day, having conversations with God, speaking with God, hearing his voice. And Satan came in and threw an obstacle in Eve's way. 
And then she became an obstacle to Adam. And that drew them on that broad path. That set them away from the path that God had ordained for them. Now God brought them back when he sacrificed a blood sacrifice to cover their sin. It was the first blood sacrifice that would finally be redeemed through Christ. But God, you see, fig leaves were not enough covering. It required a blood sacrifice, just like our sin required the blood sacrifice of Jesus. And God brought them back to the narrow path. Now it cost them, but they were still belonging to God. He did not cast them out. He cast them out of the garden, but not out of his eternal life, not out of their eternal life with him. And they lived a righteous life as much as they could, having introduced sin into the world the rest of their lives. And I know that Adam and Eve are with God even today because he's so faithful to bring us back to that narrow path. So we have a little bit of work, not for salvation, but work when we hit obstacles. We have a choice when we come to obstacles. We can either take the, the, the broad way around or allow them to narrow us even further, to hone us in, to conform us even more to Christ. See, that's what they're for. Now, the narrow entrance looks like it's almost impossible to manage or to attain, right? And a lot of people are looking for that easier way in. Jesus said himself, there's a narrow way and a broad way. And I tell you that will, many will try and will not be able to enter by the narrow way because they're looking for the easy way in. There's no easy way. We come through the blood of Jesus. But we have to follow his commandments, be obedient to his will, to submit to his calls, to submit to his purposes and his plans for our lives. And in that submission and obedience, we're going to hit some rocky places, hard places, places with obstacles, places that want to lead us astray. Now, contending for our faith, make every effort to contend. Paul uses that word again. Luke used it in Luke 13, but Paul uses it in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. I want you to hear this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Contend. Make every effort. It's the same word that Luke uses and Paul uses it here. To contend for your faith. Fight the good fight of faith. See, faith is a battle. We would like to just think that, oh, we have faith in Jesus and we're done, we're good to go. But faith is a battle. It requires us to overcome the desires of our own flesh, which, by the way, can be some of the biggest obstacles we encounter, right, in our faith journey. It means yielding to the Holy Spirit. Contend, yield, make every effort to yield to the Holy Spirit. There's no easy way to fight the good fight of faith. Spend the time necessary to see God's will accomplished in your life and let him take you through that narrow way. Broad is the way and few uh, find the different way of the narrow way. And what Jesus is saying is, listen, I am the only way. 
There is no other way to the Father but by Jesus. Jesus said that himself. There is no other way to the Father but by me. Some would like to think that they can serve church or serve Allah or Buddha, that they can be just good people and live a good life and not go to church, but just live an ethical, moral life. Doesn't work. The only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ himself by way of the cross. There is no other way. Jesus is the narrow way. And when obstacles come our way, we need to hold fast to that way. You know, scriptures are full of, are, of truths about God establishing our footsteps and guiding us on the way. Jesus declares himself to be the way, the truth, and the life that come by me. I'm the only door of the sheepfold, he says in John, that I'm the door and, and you have to come through me. The narrow door, the narrow gate is all Jesus. And I love that he gives me a word like narrow and says, Jen, yeah, the way's narrow, but when obstacles come, let them narrow your path even more. When those hardships come, let them conform you to me, to be an imitator of who I am, to be conformed into his image. That's what it means to go the narrow way. And so that's the revelation I have for you. Obstacles are good. They're hard, but obstacles are good. Listen, if you don't know this Jesus, who is the way, the only way to God, will you let us help you find him? Get online, breaststrokeministries.com. Get on the website. Message us. Call us at the office because we want to lead him to you because he is painting a picture of your life with him one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brushstroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.